you know, why is it that you know one one at one time uh, cannabis is legal, but or illegal, and now it's legal. Or, or um, it's, or it's gay, legal gay, if you take gay, a step to the left or a step to the right, but not where you're at. Right, right. Uh, getting married if you're a gay couple one day is illegal, but now it's legal. You know, so and that was pretty much what got me out of my my slumber years and years ago was kind of seeing that it's like, hey, yeah, I I don't understand how something can be wrong one day and correct the next. Welcome to Uncensored Tactical where our goal is to talk about training, tactics, and more without being limited by red tape or a sterile bureaucratic environment so that we can bring you value and insight in a way that other organizations just plain can't. Okay, so we're live with Jared Norton of the Voluntary Contrarian Podcast. So Jared, I'm so happy to have you here. This is probably going to be published on Insurgency Knitting Circle. And I might go ahead and throw it up on Uncensored Tactical, too, because we're going to talk about some miscellaneous tactical things. So for the people that don't know you, feel free to introduce yourself. Well, hey, uh, like you said, I'm Jared from the Voluntary Contrarian podcast. Um, I've been kind of podcasting since about uh, March of this year. Uh, I only have about 20 or so episodes up. I'm kind of, I'm kind of slacking at this point, but, uh, you know, I'm kind of a very podcast uh on voluntary contrarian type things and what to be my contrarian i mean it's i kind of look at things in a different way uh i'd say well it's let me step back for a sec the contrarian means that just like every other voluntarist i think we think contrary contrary to other thought out there and so i really wanted to make that kind of a part of my show that was um kind of pointing out how we voluntarists and anarchists see things differently from the status quo and, and uh, mainstream out there. So my shows have a lot, a lot of those topics out there that uh, that most people that we call status really would stand or get or they would um, kind of argue with. So that's kind of what I do and uh, I'm happy to be here. Super. We talked a little bit on the phone and um, actually we talked quite a bit on the phone, you and I. <laughs> Um, I think one of the things that you and I are both trying to tackle is, especially for those in government and in law enforcement, it's really hard to take that contrarian view and to even, even if you don't make it part of your personal beliefs, it's hard to even accept the possible questioning of what you do. I think that's tough for people sometimes. Yeah, it's, it's very tough for people to understand that sometimes, um, I think they see things from a very, very myopic view where uh, they they only know one thing. It's not really their fault. It's just because they're being inundated by a, everything from school to uh, to media to uh, just their friends around them. So it, it's it's it makes it makes people like you and I kind of look like we're talking gibberish when we're trying to talk uh, some sense and logic. I could, I could definitely see that. Um, you have anything you're drinking tonight for our special talk? Um, well, right now I'm drinking an Arrowhead sparkling water, but I, I had a, uh, oh, what is that? A Pendleton, uh, like a Pendleton. Dang it! Forgot what you call that. <laughs> I feel so bad. I, I can't, I'm, I'm from Oregon originally, and so Pendleton is part of my my home state. So I'm kind of feel. Oh, it's a, uh, a blended. Uh, Canadian whiskey, so ah, I've had, uh, okay. had had one of those earlier, and now I'm on to water. So yeah, me too. I had a uh, delicious draft uh, Yingling tonight, and now I'm on to water as well. Some Berkey filtered water, mm. and I love it. Uh, nice. So let's jump into one of the first topics that you and I. I know you wanted to kind of get some firearms talk going on your podcast, and that's something I do. I could probably do more on mine as well. Um, were you able to read that? Uh, eight fundamental myths of shooting. I think that was an article I did, or maybe an early podcast. You know, I didn't read that. I'm I'm sorry, but I yeah, I didn't, right. didn't didn't come across that. Uh, also, so you heard of the eight fundamentals of marks, marksmanship? That's really common out there. Have you heard of that? Um, no. Can well, you go over those? I real bet quick, you if I, they, I bet uh, you if I said them, you would recognize them. 
So this is almost everybody's first okay. day in shooting class. Um, you have your stance, your grip, your draw presentation, your sight alignment, your trigger management, your breathing, and your follow through and your recovery with your shooting. So those are kind of different traits of marksmanship that most instructors will start you with and try and explain. Are you familiar with some of those terms? Yeah, all those terms. All of those but, terms. Uh, yeah, apparently, apparently, Great. I figured it's been, it's been a while. <laughs> um, it's it's very much day one stuff, um, and it kind of depends on what kind of school you're going to. So I'm going to give you a little bit of my um, one of the specialties that I was highly involved with for most of my adult life. Um, one of the ways I'm going to break down these eight fundamentals, or as I like to call them, the eight fundamental myths of shooting, um, is that there is a huge difference between marksmanship and combat shooting. And one of the biggest things that most tactical instructors will get wrong is they don't properly frame what they're doing. And this is across the board. So many people struggle with this. They don't, uh, Bruce Lee had a great quote. He says, when you're training, you should have emotional content. So you shouldn't just be punching the air to punch the air. You should be trying to defend yourself and trying to inflict damage and trying to have an outcome. And there should be a reason that you're doing it. So with shooting, I think instructors, they say, okay, here's these eight fundamentals of marksmanship. And they go, you have to have all these things, which is completely false. You need almost none of them. So in real life, if you want to defend yourself and there's a bad guy and you're the good guy and you have to pull that trigger, the only thing that matters is that when that trigger breaks, the gun is pointed towards the person that you want to shoot. That's pretty much it. The rest is all nonsense. Um, and there's ways you can get better at shooting by using some of these skills in the right way, but um, let's go ahead and break it down. So number one, stance. Even as a very young kid, uh, my father was highly involved in combat arts and shooting and self-defense, um, and he hammered it in, into my head as a child, like as like an 11, 11 year old kid. He was like, you know, when you're shooting, you should always be either on the move and or behind cover. That's it. Over and over and over in my head. There's two things you always do in a shootout. You should be behind cover or getting to cover by moving. So it's a really bad idea to stand out in the open and just plant your feet and start throwing lead down range while someone's shooting back at you. However, 99% of weapons training, even professionally, even in the military and even in law enforcement, what do you do? You stand there with your feet planted and you put the gun out in front of you and you just stand there and start shooting. So that's a fundamental myth of marksmanship. You should be shooting on the move, which means both your feet should be moving, which means the point is moot. Right. So if you're training 99% of the time to have both feet planted in a, per, in a specific position, you're fucking yourself. So that's one of the first myths I was, I'm happy to so, dig into. So that that's, that's the whole, like, as have I been taught, you know, get off the X as they. Mm -hmm. And sometimes in a gunfight, it's not important to put lead down range. It's important to leave as fast as you can. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. The first rule of the first rule of winning a gunfight is to not be in a gun. <laughs> yes. So situational awareness too. I, we're, I think I have that listed somewhere down the line here. Uh, let's just speed through a couple just to get some good content out. Grip. I went to, uh, back when it was called Blackwater, do you remember them? They were a pretty yes. nefarious group overseas, nefarious. They were. Um, I did some training at their facility, which was a fantastic facility. They had some great instructors, and our instructor put a moving steel plate at 50 yards away, and it was running track left and right, and he took his pistol, and he flipped it upside down, and he got a grip on the gun. So the barrel was under his hand, and the trigger he manipulated with his pinky, and he puts the gun out in front of him, and plink-ting, plink-ting, was hitting this target every time. Okay, the argument of grip is pretty much over at this point. Do you have to have the pro proper grip in the proper way perfectly? No, absolutely not. With one, ca with one caveat. Sure. Un unless you own a Springfield XD. <laughs> <laughs> That I will never, not work. <laughs> I never liked that. I really never did like that system. Uh, but yeah, it's no, a great, great point. <laughs> um, and yeah, you should train all these things and you should understand what they are. 
but I think if you're learning shooting for self-defense, that's very important to frame it. If you're shooting for marksmanship, I don't give a fuck. Take all your all the time you want working on these fundamentals. If you're worried about combat shooting or self-defense shooting, I think almost none of these are important. Uh, let's talk about the next one, sight. Uh, even in simunitions training, when you're not shooting real bullets, and, and even when you are shooting real bullets, a huge majority of people either have one or two things concerning their sights. Either A, they don't look at their sights when they're shooting someone, or B, they don't mm-hmm. remember looking at their sights when they're shooting someone. So is your sight alignment important? Well, it's important that the gun is pointed towards the bad guy. It's not as important that your eyeball sees your rear sight and then sees your front sight and then sees a fuzzy target after it. People spend a lot of time focusing on that. And A, they focus on it wrong, in my opinion. And B, they spend too much time focusing on it, period. Uh, the Israelis That's a good have, point. The Israelis have a term for it. They call it uh, point shooting. And they, their yes. special forces do just that. So if you have a, one of the best militaries on a planet specifically telling you, ah, fuck your sights, well, then maybe it's not necessarily a fundamental of combat shooting. Maybe a fundamental right. of marksmanship, yes, for Olympic shooting, sure, but not for combat shooting. So you have to frame it correctly when you're training. Right. Uh, trigger management. Yeah. Sorry, no, you, you had a caveat? Go ahead. No, I was, I was going to interrupt for a sec to say. Yeah, please do. So, so from from the get go, as soon as you start, you you know, kind of laid out the eight fundamentals. Mm-hmm. Um, it really kind of reminded me after you said them of kind of dare I say, I'd say FUD type uh, rules and fundamentals. I, th- I think those are the things you would learn if you were to go to your grandpa and ask him how to shoot. Uh, he would tell you these these uh, you know. Exactly. List off things you listed off, and that's if you're in a if you're at a range, you're static, and mm-hmm. you're just putting holes in paper. So I totally agree with you. It, it, these are all fundamentals so far, and I'm sure the rest of them will probably be as well. <laughs> that that pretty much only uh, apply to when you're again at a static range and you're just trying to practice putting you know holes, or as they say, turning money into into noise. Uh, yeah, at a range. I've never heard that. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> um, yeah, it is. You're right. It, and that's the way it's framed when it's presented. And they even, unfortunately, do it in military and law enforcement. Well, they'll, they'll spend a week saying, okay, which fundamental you know, are you having trouble with? Well, none of them. I'm shooting paper. I'm standing here. No one's shooting back at me. I'm not moving. I'm not allowed to move. So I'm not really struggling with fundamentals. I'm struggling with you're teaching me marksmanship when I need to learn combat. So again, exactly. I'm, so I'm not really picking on the fundamentals themselves. I'm picking on the framing of them. Yeah, I agree. Yes. Um, trigger management. Yeah, could be very important. If you slap the trigger a lot, the gun could go left or right or up or down or whatever direction. Uh, but if you look at any 7-Eleven robbery on YouTube, when you're shooting from the hip and the guy's three feet from you across the register, you can slap that trigger as hard as you want and at three feet, you should still hit the bad guy. Mm-hmm. So that one's pretty much moot. And then breathing. The way breathing is taught as a marksmanship fundamental is you take a deep breath. <laughs> you breathe out. Oh, and when you've breathed all of your air out, you pause and you slowly pull the trigger to the, push the trigger to the rear. And then the gun goes off. Mm-hmm. If you're learning self-defense, that is absolutely terrible. <laughs> exactly yes you're you're dead you do that and then all combat shoot and we'll see who wins <sighs> right <sighs> okay so exactly breathing is fucked uh follow through and recovery you should have a good second shot that's your weapon control it's making sure the muzzle doesn't rise that could that could probably be arguably the only point in these eight that i don't disagree with you should have a gun that doesn't go pew and go lift up towards the stars and then level out again you should be able to shoot the mm-hmm. weapon, pow, and it should be back on sights again. Sure. Mm-hmm. That's probably the only one I'm okay, I'm okay with. So Right, I agree. Thus endeth my first rant of the episode. That's my eight fundamental <laughs> myths of shooting. <laughs> yeah, it reminds me, and of course, I, I, I am no firearms expert whatsoever. Um, I, I did, I have, I have earned my coveted, you know, NRA uh, pistol instructor's uh, certification for whatever that's worth 
but that mm. pretty much it, that pretty much uh, allows me to teach people exactly the fundamentals you just brought up because uh, it, it's mm. to me it's 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 for the novice just coming into the interest. I think that's probably great for them, and it's really enjoyable for me to help people uh, gain some confidence and at least get them used to holding something that can take a life, you know, in their hands. Mm -hmm. um, however, I've moved from that to, uh, to being a, uh, an assistant trainer for a security uh, training company. And when I went to advance after I, you know, got through that and not got through that, but after I helped out on that and tried to improve on my own, as far as actually attending more combat oriented classes, I found it to be very cost prohibitive and the, the ranges around here, at least in the Northwest, they, they won't allow any type of actual firearms training, you know, mm. by, by yourself. You can't, you know, you can't practice, you know, your draw from appendix. You can't practice malfunction drills. You can't practice, uh, you know, a failure drill or something like that. You just got to stand there with your feet spread, shoot one round, shoot one round, and shoot one round. And it's very hard for anyone. And this is why I actually had this rant earlier with my wife. This really frustrates me that and I'm not sure what's holding that up. Is it liability to the uh to the range as far as why they won't allow people to actually train the way people should be trained if when it comes to self-defense mm -hmm. and i'm not sure i mean it must be it means, it's probably some about money and lawyers apparently because no one's doing it <laughs> yeah the liability monkey on your back huh that's that's kind of yeah that's kind of strange in this company there's kind of a duality here where you have the country on the planet arguably with the most <laughs> you know besides somalia right everybody that's arguing right. against us um mm -hmm. besides somalia we have one of the freest gun laws as a country in the nation but of all these shooting ranges and all these gun stores it's really hard to find a place that you can go and practice real combat shooting it's it's tough to find a location where they they don't nickel and dime you with you know you're firing too fast and you're firing too loud and you can't shoot two bullets at once yeah, you can't move. Can't drop can't, the uh, can't move. Exactly. Yes. Okay. Exactly. You're you're totally right. Country that is supposed to be well, at least most of the country at this point is. Uh, I'd say Second Amendment, uh, for lack of a better term, um, supporting. That really hasn't followed up in the private sector when it comes to actual ranges. Again, I don't want to beat a, beat a dead horse here, but I'm not sure why that is. You know, if I had if I had the money and the inclination, I would probably do something like that myself, just to help folks not just get into a routine of of you know punching holes in paper, but actually learn some techniques that were they're good for them and not not charge them an arm and a leg in order to defend their, themselves. I love it. We could talk about this all day. <laughs> <That's just great. laughs> Uh, this is going to be published on your platform too. Let me give maybe a two second, that's uh, two second, two minute intro just real quick for me, for your, your audience that I don't think has met me yet. Uh, I'm sure. Pat, I'm Pat and I run uncensored tactical.com. I'm also a co-host over on insurgency knitting circle.com, uh, former military, former law enforcement. I left both largely because of my volunteerism ideals. Uh, I'm in the private sector now, but I still work with security and I am in the process of turning my website into my full-time job. I have a normal nine to five right now in the private security field. And, uh, luckily my, my employers support my side endeavors. So I am, I teach my lock picking course. It's probably the only thing I, I monetize for now is my lock picking course. Um, I teach how to break into places and how to break out of restraints Break-in is really a bad term. I shouldn't use that one as much. Uh, I teach you how to make entry into locked obstacles uh, as long as you are morally righteous in doing so. I also teach people how to break out of illegal restraints. 
Uh, so that's it. That's that's me. And I, I, I call my website uncensored, so I don't know if you really need a warning about my language or my views or my delivery. <laughs> right. And do you have any, do you have any uh, do you have content out about your, aside from your podcasts, is that correct? Uh, yeah, I do. I don't do as many um, just true articles and as many, you know, just video content for my skill sets that I teach. Um, I plan on doing much more of that, but my schedule's, my schedule makes it so easy to record and publish once a week for a podcast. Um, some of the video stuff, but, because I want to pack so much uh, value into it, it, just takes so much time. But you have a uh, you have a website or something that, mm-hmm. that folks can get a hold of you yeah. in order to get uh, training just, from you? Sure. It's just uncensoredtactical.com. One word. And on all, on, uh, let's see, I'm most active on Instagram also. Uh, let's see, Instagram, the website. And uh, you can just email me direct, and that's at uncensoredtactical at gmail.com. I don't do Facebook. I don't do uh, Twitter. Uh, but I have a YouTube channel and Instagram and a website and a podcast on cool. almost all cool. your p- podcast platforms. You can just search Uncensored Tactical, and you'll find me. And uh, which area of the country are you training? I currently live in Florida, but I am more than happy to travel internationally as long as the— uh, as long as I have enough students to fill the class, I'm I'm happy to travel. Cool. Sounds good. Uh, so that is actually my part two of the three parts I wanted to talk about tonight. So we can jump into some lock picking stuff if you if you like. Sure. Let's do it. All right. Here's my elevator pitch. Tactical lock picking. <laughs> Let's really quickly go over what it is not. It is not a locksmith, but with a gun. It is not hobby lock picking on your couch. It is not the pretty cool, unique hobby sport of lock sport. It's not a challenging each other to pick more difficult keyways. Uh, and it's also not um, one of these newer careers that are out there, uh, pen testing, penetration testing, or red teaming. It's not that either. Although all four of those things, you could definitely apply this skill set to. So what is it? I teach the practical and field application of lock picking and other entries whether it's a home a vehicle a padlock or how to how to escape out of locked obstacles like handcuffs flex cuffs and duct tape i teach a course it's a two-day course it's eight hours both days Um, and it is very very hands-on it is packed with value and i teach based on principles and the, the curriculum of tactical lock picking which i i have created and organized and systemized myself through real life field experience, not just in my garage, in my underwear. Um, The curriculum is designed around learning it as a student and it's designed around reteaching so that you can teach others how to use it. So that's my long elevator pitch. Hopefully it was many, many floors. All right, so I gave you my elevator pitch. Did you? I, we had some technical difficulty, but did you hear that? I did. I, I heard your whole uh, elevator pitch, and then okay. I, 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 said, I said something, and then uh, all of a sudden it kind of just went away. So, Well, here's a, uh, an analogy, too, to kind of follow up with that that I've been telling people recently. Um, in the same way that you could go to a medical course and they could teach you, okay, this is how you give an IV. And this is how you check someone's blood pressure. And this is how you apply a tourniquet. If you leave that course, you know how to give an IV, check a blood pressure, and put on a tourniquet. That does not prepare you to walk up to a car accident and see someone laying on the ground and go, okay, I know what to do. So while putting tourniquets on and giving IVs might be part of what you do, I fill that gap and I say, okay, here's how you pick a lock. Here's how you slip a latch. Here's how you go under, around, or over, or even some destructive entries I'll teach. But when you walk up on a scene, there is so much value that I try to build into my curriculum and my course where I say, okay, you should be calling resources before you even try and pick a lock. If you, if by looking at it, you know, it might take you a couple minutes. So it's easy to say, especially in places like a, if you're in a first responder and someone's having a heart attack inside, Let's say maybe you can't breach the door open or you can't kick it open or for some reason it's just not your best bet. You can start picking that lock. You can also say to your partner, hey, get on the phone with the people that own the apartment complex and try and get a maintenance guy over here with a key. 
I'm going to start making entry. And if I can't get in, then the key will be here soon. Instead of the guy that goes to the other lock picking course and says, I know how to pick a lock. I got this back up. And then spends 20 fucking minutes trying to pick his way in and he might never get in. And now that he's failed, he has to go, well, shit, we're going to have to try something else. So that's, that's what I try very hard to bring to my students is your order of operations, how you purchase and buy your gear, what gear not to buy, um, how to know locks based on that identification and which ones are going to take which amount of time and how to manage all of that, let alone also how to, you know, how to do the different skill sets. So that's, I kind of feel like I'm yelling at the audience, but that's my passion. I'm happy to talk about that stuff. <laughs> no, that's, that's really cool. And it, uh, it, it, I never actually thought of it that way as far as being an aide to, you know, say a first responder or, or, you know, whether it's just a, you know, a private citizen who, who needs to help out their, their neighbor or whatever to hear them, you know, I don't know, gasping or, or screaming or something, you know, if you're choking on something, I, I don't know, but there's a lot of scenario, scenarios you can actually use to, um, where that would come in very valuable. Uh, like you said, it's kind of like a, an emergency. Of course, you want to try getting a hold of the, you know, the primary key holder or, you know, someone who can actually access, you know, with a key, but to have those skill sets is definitely valuable. And I, I get that. Yeah. All right. Have you done any, have you tinkered with any lock picking ever? You know, you know, I haven't, I really, I never really, Uh, yeah, I was going to say, I, I have not done any lockpick training. Um, but now that you kind of frame it in that way that you did, it sounds like I should probably do so because I don't know. It just seems like a valuable skill to know. Uh, most you, of, could, you could say, you could save uh, either you know, yourself or, or somebody else. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, sorry, go ahead. That's all right. Uh, there's a, there's a ton of benefits to it. Um, I get a lot of um, a lot of guys that are super tough guys. Some of the responses I hear to why people don't need to learn lock picking are, uh, "I got a boot, I I can kick any door open." Okay, well, let's hash that one out real quick. You can't kick an outward opening door in, even on a shitty apartment. <laughs> that's really tough unless you kick through the actual door itself. Um, another one I hear often is, "I got a gun, I don't need a lock pick." Okay, well. Try shooting a doorknob with your nine mil. Good luck. Hey, just you know, make sure I'm not around when you do it. Probably not going to work the way you think. Um, I hear people say, "I got bolt cutters." Okay, well if you're in a commercial building or even a residential building, if you're trying to get through the front door of a house, show me where you're going to put the bolt cutters, please. You know. Right. So now, now wait. Hold on one second. I, I got a serious question here. Sure. What's up? So, are you telling me that when in the movies? when they shoot a padlock or a, a door lock, it doesn't automatically just open. <laughs> you know, I actually, I have a buddy that's local that does some lock picking and I can see him and I doing some collaboration real soon. One of the projects I was just going to call him about today was starting maybe even a whole new website. That's only devoted to recreating lock picking in movies. I think that would be a lot of fun to show you, how Hollywood gets that so blatantly wrong so often. So kind of a, a myth busters, but uh, kind of a lock and uh, yeah, lock style. Yes. And I'd like to like recreate it with the tools and the setups that they have and show you how just ludicrous, ridiculous it is. I think that'd yeah, be that would fun. be genius. I, I would, I would watch that. Yes. Um, so yeah, it's, there's a lot of, um, a lot of bravado around, trying to get through locked obstacles. And a lot of that bravado is not even well-intended, let alone well-placed um, and just blatantly wrong. Um, one of the training tools I use is like a, a, it's like a hockey puck lock. You see it often on the backs of double doored vehicles, um, like phone company cars, or even like locksmith vehicles on the backs of the van, oh, yeah. the two doors swing out when they swing together. There's like a hockey puck, like a silver hockey puck lock that goes in the middle. Yep. So during the course, I take that thing out and I go, you know, we talk a little bit about destructive entry and I give guys a chance to actually use bolt cutters to cut through a padlock and say, well, it's not as easy as you thought, huh? Even with big bolt cutters. 
A lot of people don't know that you have to often make two cuts in a lock or two cuts on a chain link to open it up, not just one. Um, so there's a lot of myth out there, and I I really love it. It's a big passion of mine. Uh, so I bring out this tool, and I say, okay, now take those bolt cutters and show me where you put them on this lock. And there's, of course, nowhere to put it. So another big part of what I teach is, um, you know, tactical lock picking is designed to use in the field. And a lot of that requires different directions, different hand switching, reaching over or through an obstacle or under an obstacle, um, and just being creative in difficult situations. Um, I had a student uh, on Instagram. I don't know if student, I don't know if he was ever in one of my courses, was he? Um, he learned quite a bit from me, I think, just from my Instagram, my YouTube. So he messaged me on Instagram last week and he said, Pat, you are 100% correct. A one minute opening of a lock on your couch is a 10 minute opening in the field. He's like, you nailed it. He's like, your couch is not the field. And I'm like, oh my God, thank you. I love hearing the feedback. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that makes sense a lot. I mean, it's kind of like, it's kind of like people who, uh, well, you know, it's like, like the mall ninja type people who, you know, they, they watch a couple of YouTube videos, uh, you know, I'm not saying yours, but you know, it's things that are more, uh, you know, say, uh, there's a guy actually on Instagram. I forgot who he is, but he actually does that. I'm going to kind of change it for a second here. Yeah. Uh, he actually does some, uh, he, he carries appendix, you know, his firearms here. He carries appendix. And he does all these videos of himself drawing and shooting and things like that. Uh, and it's always like in his, his living room or his dining room or something. And people were giving him crap about how, you know, he wasn't doing this right or doing that right. Well, he started doing videos of him actually out on the range and he was freaking nailing stuff. Hmm. And it was, it was incredible to see a guy who was kind of, I don't know if he had any actually, you know, professional training or anything. But the guy was just, he put all the haters to shame. Uh, I wish I knew the guy's name, but uh, yes. it, it, it kind of reminds me of that where, you know, a guy can, can actually... I'm not saying you don't need to seek professional training for anything that you do. I'm trying to say you can learn a lot from, from videos, at least to get yourself in a good spot to where you can, I guess, be successful to a point. And there's always room for improvement, especially if you go to like, like your class, for example, mm -hmm. actually get that hands-on experience. Yeah. That's one of the biggest bones I have to pick in this industry is, um, I've been to a handful of other people's very expensive lock picking courses and I know quite a few people in the industry and I very much pride myself on this curriculum is not what other people teach. This is what I have created and organized and systemized myself so that other people can be successful in the field. And like I said, the EMT uh, analogy, other places will teach you a technique. I teach you the technique and how to bring that to fruition in the field with your before, your during, and your after, including how, in, how to handle your managers on scene, whether it's a, you know, a first responder supervisor, or whether it's your boss asking you to do something at work. Um, how do you handle before, during, and after that? We talk about ethics quite a bit. Um, so kind of, we'll use that as a segue. Let's talk about ethics. Cause I teach, I used to say in a lot of my videos and content, I'd stay, I'd say, uh, stay smart, you know, use smart tactics and stay legal. Just kind of like a cover my bases and like a cute little sign off. But being a voluntarist, voluntarist, uh, let's talk about what does that mean? Stay legal. Does that mean you're a good person if you follow laws, if you blindly follow what's written down on paper by politicians? So maybe we can spend the last 10 to 15 minutes here talking about government or law enforcement or whatever. Yeah. Before that, I wanted to go into one thing, um, real quick, if I could, mm -hmm. um, so speaking of staying legal, what, what kind of things should someone look out for if they do have some lock picking tools on them? Um, whether it's, you know, they're in a car or, you know, they're, or they're going through the airports or they're going into a, you know, a government building or, or whatever, you know, what kind of things should, should people be aware of when they're carrying those kind of tools? Sure. Uh, I got good news, bad news. <laughs> Um, let's start with the bad news. Bad news is even most cops that I've personally face to face talked to or worked with or trained in my life, most cops don't even know the laws surrounding lockpicks. They often don't even know the laws surrounding gun laws. Um, 
that it's just the nature of the beast. Um, I am experienced in law enforcement, although I don't do it anymore. Uh, what I tell people all the time is that cops, especially patrol cops, they work the big four or the big five crimes over and over and over just with different variables here and there. Um, unless they have a specific bone to pick and they do the research and they memorize it and they read case study. And I mean, most cops handle people fighting each other, people stealing from one another, people hurting, you know, hurting property, uh, people bothering one another. And that's it. Like that's, that's most of what you do as a cop over and over and over. So most cops don't know lockpick laws. Uh, let me give you an answer so that can bring you some value instead of just bitching and complaining. There's two places to go for really good info on that. One is tool.us, T-O-O-O-L. There's a triple O in the middle, T-O-O-O-L.us. Uh, if you search through their website, um, or I think if you just put a backslash and then put laws, um, they take you to a page where they show you a map. You can click on your state, and they will give you a not only their... Um, summary of your state law, but they'll give you a link so that you can do your own source research and go to your own state legislator website and look up the code number and the statute number and read what your state says from the source. Uh, so tool.us is a really good website. You can also go to Wikipedia. If you just go to Wikipedia and search lockpick laws, they actually have a pretty good write-up. Um, I've checked the two of those side by side and I checked several states like down the list. Um, and they are really, really close to one another. Um, but like I said, the catch-all would be doing your own research for your own state. And those are two good starting points. Uh, off the top of my head, I think Tennessee is one of the worst um, as far as lockpicking laws. Most of the other states, like 45 or 46 of them, are mostly good to go. Um, and the way that these websites that you're looking at, the way that they will often organize lockpick laws for different states is um, they'll use a term called um, the intent. So they'll talk about, you know, is it legal to possess? Yes or no. And then they'll say it must show intent or they'll say the picks themselves are evidence of a crime. So just having the lockpick means that you're a criminal. And in most states, like in Florida, I know definitely in Florida, you are 100% allowed to walk around with any lockpick you like. However, if you're doing something fucking stupid and sneaky in the middle of the night wearing all black outside someone's window between the bushes in their window, and you get caught with lockpicks, that is an extra charge that the police are going to give you for having a what they call uh, burglary tools, possession of burglary tools. So in Florida, you must show the intent to use your tools or to be in a situation where you would use your tools. So if you're walking around normal banker's hours doing your thing and everybody's happy, it's 100% legal in Florida. Okay. That's good to know. So yeah, definitely uh, check with your own your own state and go to, was that T-O-O-L dot U-S, huh? Check out your own state for your your laws and rules to make sure you don't become a victim of being yes. caged. <laughs> and there's some good news. Even if you're one of these in one of these few prohibitive States, uh, if you have some paper clips in your pocket and you have no intent to commit any crime, do you have lockpick tools? I would argue absolutely not. However, in my courses, I teach everybody how to, make a very quick and very rapid um, tension wrench and a rake tool. So usually when you pick a lock, you need two tools, not just one like on TV. Uh, you need a tool mm -hmm. to spin the plug of the lock. So where the key would go in, you need something to spin that and put some turning pressure on it. You need another tool to go in and lift each pin to the correct height. Uh, so you can make an effective for low, you know, your low security or some of your medium security locks. Uh, you can get into probably about 30% or 40% ish of almost every residential front door in the country with a pair of paper, paper clips. Maybe, mm. maybe on a bad day, you're like 25%, but that's a lot. That is a lot of houses that you can get into with just paper clips. So there's some tools that don't look like tools. You know, who's to say what is and isn't a lockpick? If you have a small metal tool shaped to maybe shape clay, because that's one of your hobbies, 
uh, I, don't, I don't know what that tool is or isn't. You'd have to uh, maybe consult an expert. Mm-hmm. Or or maybe s- stencil it with clay shaping tool. I'm not, I would never tell anybody how to uh, break a law. Because, you know, law, laws keep us safe, right? That's what the politicians are there for. To teach us yeah, sure. morality. <laughs> yeah. Mm, dude. Exactly. I'm halfway through Larkin Rose's book right now. Um, the most dangerous superstition. I can't read more than two or three pages without my brain lighting on fire. That guy is fantastic. Yeah, he he's pretty amazing. I haven't read any of his books yet, but I've watched a ton of his videos. A ton of his videos, um, yeah. Yeah. So, no, I have a. I don't know. I, I have a hard time. I don't know. I've read, I, I like to read, but sometimes I, I kind of like reading more of the economics of, you know, I love, I love Austrian economics. And so I kind of focus more on that than the, I feel like I get more, a lot of content from videos on, on voluntarism, but I should definitely actually, um, I guess for, for no, for no better reason, but just to kind of support him by purchasing one of his books. So that's probably a good thing to do right there. Just kind of, you know, throw him whatever percentage he gets for his books to support him. Probably a good idea. I bought two. I bought one for me and then one to uh, give to a friend. The page I just finished, um, I actually am luckily at my nine to five. I usually get, sometimes I'll get quite a bit of downtime at work. So the last page I read while I was at my desk at work was, um, It sticks out of my head. It's such a great piece of perspective. He says, a lot of people get their morals from religion. And he says, not even your God changes his mind, you know, has the ability or the power or the will to change his mind about morality. He says what you should do and what you should not do. And he says, government, this made up pretend thing called government who thinks they have this authority they change their mind all the time and they say one day an act is moral and good and the next day that same exact act is bad and evil. And he says they claim to have a power that not even your God claims to have to switch morality from day to day. And I thought, holy shit, that's great. Yeah, that that's freaking solid right there. That's a great, uh, it's a great example of, of, and I think and that's one of the reasons why when, so I hear someone or, you know, a lot of people around me or you see, you know, in uh, social media or so, they're still so stuck on their own viewpoint or own belief is that they, for some reason, fail to see that one simple thing that even their own, you know, uh, for lack of a better term, their, their own God, as far as government is, they change their laws and morality um whether it's day to day or whether it's election cycle to election cycle, uh, yet they still support them as if, okay, the wind's blowing this way. Let's support them this way. Okay. Well, not blowing this way. Okay. They must be right because, but they don't stop to think, well, if there's supposed to be some type of, uh, I don't want to say deity. Cause I mean, they don't, they don't, they don't think they see them as a deity. They just think that they are this, this, this force that they respect because it's government and because it's USA and it's democracy. Yay. Uh, but they never stop to think about the small things that, that happens. They just follow the wind as it blows. And I, I can't personally understand why they do that. And like I said, they never stop to actually question, uh, you know, why is it that, you know, one, one, at one time, uh, cannabis is legal, but are illegal. And now it's legal or, or um, it's, or it's gay, legal gay, if you take gay, a step to the left or a step to the right, but not where you're at. Right. Right. Uh, getting married. If you're a gay couple one day is illegal, but now it's legal, you know? So, and that was pretty much what got me out of my, my slumber years and years ago was kind of seeing that it's like, Hey, yeah, I, I don't understand how something can be wrong one day and correct the next. It, it just seemed like, that, again, that snapped me out of my slumber, and ever since then, I've been kind of going, looking more and more at at, uh, at what they're doing. But that was years ago, so now I'm kind of just a, a grumpy old uh, anarchist now who just wants to give the middle finger to, you know, all sides and every sides of everything <laughs> related to government. So you know how it is. Yeah, I'm I'm over it as well. I'm very I'm so yeah. much happier now. 
yeah, I just, yeah, I, I just wish that there were more people who could, could kind of see the, you know, the man behind the curtain and, and just go, Oh, okay. Now I see it for what it is. And, uh, I'm going to remove myself from that world because it's, it's all lies and it's all control and it's all coercion and step away from it. Like, you know, you said you did and I did, and a lot of us did. Um, it's a much more, you feel a kind of combination of much more free, but you kind of see the world for how it actually is. And it's, it's sometimes, it's not, I can't say frightening, but it's concerning that you still see this turmoil all around you. Um, in all this vitriol and all this, you know, well, you suck. Well, fuck you. But yeah, fuck you back and forth. And you're like, Jesus, how come you people are so angry at each other? If you just take a step back and look and get over your, 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 the indoctrination and get over, you know, you were told this and you were taught that and think for yourselves for once, you'll be much happier. And I can't wait till that happens where, where more people, more people actually kind of make that decision to, like I said, I keep saying it over and over again, but, but step back and look and you'll be much happier if you do. That resonates quite a bit with me. I totally understand what you're saying. I, uh, I, we're conditioned to, to want to hate each other. I'm over it. I'm so over that part of it. I, it's, I mean, it's the shiny red ball. It's the witch doctor of the tribe saying, oh, the scary thing over there. Don't go over there. Listen to me. Trust me. A, right. Uh, I'm over the game. I'm, I'm not drinking the Kool-Aid anymore. Uh, so one of the uh, bullet points. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, I, 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 wrote, I wrote kind of a, a what would you call it, a, a, a paper or a blog or whatever it was a while back. And I was trying to really get into the types of people that, and this works for, this works for the kind of human nature as a whole. And I was trying to question myself as, as far as what makes people, what, what makes people think the way they do to the point where they're willing to, uh, kind of, kind of hold fast beliefs, in opposition to other people. And I found, well, at least in, in my own brain, I found that there are, and I don't want to generalize here, but just because that was a kind of a mental exercise, I was trying to break it down and kind of figure it out what makes sense to me, which there's two different types of, of groups. And they were those who are more, well, it's kind of like tribalism. Um, the reason, you know, tribes are brought about were obviously just through, uh, you know, a family and, uh, people that you could trust. And the reason why they formed tribes is because you needed to have a number of people in a tribe to help, uh, protect the tribe and feed the tribe and nurture the tribe and those kinds of things. And that's followed through even but it's just part of human nature. It's followed through to 2019 and will be here for, you know, for ever. But I, I figured that there are two types. Again, those who have a kind of a more of a big tent mentality where they, they feel more comfortable in greater numbers. So they're less discerning as far as, uh, they will allow more people into their tent based on a more broad agreement or definition of, of, of whatever the topic would be. And I use the analogy of sports teams. Um, up here in the Northwest, the Seattle Seahawks uh, have been kind of the, the rage for the past, geez, 10, 15 years. And there are a number of people who, you know, they have Seahawks flags and 12th man flags and uh, Seahawks gear everywhere. And it kind of show, it kind of signals other people that if you have a, you know, a Seahawks jersey on, you're kind of part of that tribe. And it's become so prevalent that it seems like almost everybody has some type of Seahawks gear on, especially during C or during football season. Mm -hmm. So that's more of the big, that's more of the big tent thing I'm talking about. 
And on the other side is the more discerning type of people, the more small tent people, the more the people who are more uh, pedantic as far as their beliefs. And I would find these people to be more interested in kind of the minutia or the meta about people. And they eschew those who are more big tent people. And uh, and to kind of and what I mean by that is it's like people who are don't have an interest in Seahawks because Seahawks that you know the whole interest in in being part of a larger group is not appealing to them. They'd rather be part of a smaller group because they find that they're more focused on, I'd say, either as they would call it, maybe intelligence or, like I said, pedantic um, beliefs. Like um, I'm a, you know, I'm a vegan. Um, uh, I don't know. I identify as a, a, a vegan dragon kin or something like that. And you know, there's not many people out there who who can follow who who are in that group. So to kind of pull this full circle, I kind of see politics kind of being similar to that. Is that the reason why there is such the, this this inability to kind of release themselves from politics? Is I see that most folks are kind of like in this well, team red or team blue, and then I see folks who are more into the minutia, which is say, um, therefore, uh, you know, the SJWs or Antifa or, or whatever side you go to. And those more pedantic groups seem to be kind of steering the, the conversation when it comes to politics. Uh, and that's why I think that there is no movement because each group who finds these, these, these more intricate details in either the Republicans or Democrats or conservatives or liberals have their heels dug in so far that there is no give. And I think it's, that's the core group. It's like the, the nucleus of, of each group isn't going to change anytime soon. And for that reason, uh, I'm not sure where I was really going with this, but no. for that reason, that's why I kind of see that, that, that you won't, we won't see those two teams dissolving anytime soon. Uh, and especially because like they have this, again, this passion and vitriol against anybody who dare say anything against their team or their tribe. Uh, so anyway, that was my little, my little rant. That's my rant for today. Good. Happy to have it. Yeah, definitely resonate resonates with me. Uh, we're, uh, I see a lot of dual episodes here in both of our futures. Um, and we talked about too, probably a good note to maybe close out in them. It's getting late here on the East coast. Um, we're up against our, you know, our anarchists here. Any type of government is not what we're, you know, an, an anarchist or a voluntarist is really for, I believe. Um, so it's the ones that are not for the government versus every other person out there that wants every different type of government. And we're up against a trillion dollar a year propaganda machine. People make trillions and trillions of dollars of profit because of government that they otherwise would have no way to make. There's no way to make mm -hmm. the profit that you make without government. So people protect that. So we're literally up against a trillion dollar a year propaganda machine that promotes government and authority. Uh, so I'm anti that. It's a, it's a tough battle for the little guy. However, there were some little guys in our history that stood up against the biggest power on the planet at the time, and that worked out pretty well for them, or so it seems, unless, unless I've got part of that story wrong. That would be the American Revolution in 1776, which maybe we could talk more about that some other time, but I, I still question the way the history book writes that one, although it sounds great. Um, I still have some questions about that. Yeah, that would be an excellent, uh, excellent uh, podcast topic for another show for sure. I mean, it's a, it's a very, a very deep topic that uh, um, I'd like to hear your your thoughts and opinions on because, yeah, I, I mean, although you know, I got to say that though that those days, you know, in quotation are romanticized, I, I wouldn't mind knowing the actual non. Uh, public textbook um, version of it to really kind of see what went on. Uh, but that also brings to mind that, you know, a lot of, I'm 
I think I could speak for a lot of voluntarists and, and anarchists that, uh, or maybe I can't, maybe it's just my own opinion, but you know, to me, I wouldn't mind seeing the same thing happen again. Although I don't think it would turn out the same, <laughs> in the same way, uh, in, in this day and age, I, I really don't think that, you know, because I mean, if you look at the three percenters, the three percenters, you know, which, you know, came from, uh, and that's just, and actually that's kind of disagreed upon as far as the the number of the percentage of people who actually took up arms uh, in defense of uh, you know against the British, but you know is there even three percent? I know the three percenters, you know the quote unquote group, uh, you know they call themselves patriots and they and they they hold fast these beliefs you know about protecting the united states from from tyranny but if you look at what's actually happening around us um there's there's tyranny all around us and i don't see those people doing anything uh, i think if anything they're more uh they're more statist than well obviously they're more statist than, than voluntarists and anarchists but i think if they're actually a group of people who would unite against true tyranny, there would be way less than 3%. So there's probably, you know, maybe a tenth of a percent who are actually uh, in the know, or as, 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 we, as they say, woke. I hate using that term, but... Woke AF. <laughs> yes, woke AF. I mean, what do you think? Do you think there's actually, you know, the, the actual three percenters that are out there who, you know, have to stand up, you know, with in all their military, you know, their airsoft gear and, and you know, <clears throat> excuse me, they pose for pictures, you know, for, you know, uh, for media and call themselves these freedom fighters on, on U.S. soil. I mean, what, do you think they're actually doing anything to protect, you know, the average citizen or protect us from tyranny? Do I th- is your question? Do I think the military is protecting us from tyranny? No, no. The the three percenters. Three percenters. The, you know, the, oh, the yeah. What? Well, l- let's do this. We'll make this the last note because I'm I'm uh, struggling over here. Um, yeah, me too. I got to get the I can, I can hear my <laughs> hear my voice crackling because I'm getting tired. Um, a short story about the three percenters. Uh, at one point, I had left the military and left law enforcement and. I had a ton of money saved up and I was taking my time, but I needed something to keep me busy. So I Uber drove. I drove this sweet old lady and I told her I did a little bit of security consulting and some teaching, which I did. Uh, And she was like, sweet. My son is in a uh, group called the three percenters. And I'm like, you know, I don't really know much about that. And she's like, well, it's, you know, it's people like you, like military people, cops and, you know, everybody, people in government, there's high ranking politicians, Two and it's local people and they're all going to band together if something happens and you know they're here to protect us against the bad maybe she said bad government maybe she said bad people i don't know and i thought ah i'll look into it so i get home i go on my computer and the only place i can get information like about my local chapter was on facebook the number one biggest spy tool on the planet maybe arguably second place to Google. And I'm like, wait a second. The people that are going to plan and train and defend against a bad government invasion, the only place they have their information listed on the internet is on the biggest spy tool that the government owns. And I was like, you facepalm moment. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. And so that was my short, the short period when I thought, Hey, maybe there's something to that. And then I realized, no, no, there's not. Well, that pretty much answers my question. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of kind of the direction I was going in as well. It's like the colonists saying, "Hey, let's meet up at the local red coat courthouse, and we'll all put the sign up sheet for the anti red coat list up on the walls." Right. Exactly. Brilliant. Yeah, I don't think so. All right. Well, Jared, it's been a blast talking to you. I know we talked quite a bit on the phone, and we tried recording once, and it didn't work out. So. Even through the couple technical difficulties tonight, I still had a blast. So I see a lot in our future for some collaboration. Oh yeah, me too. It, it's it's always a a good time talking to you. I mean, we we seem to. What's cool is we 
we're kind of in the same mentality in one aspect, but I think that we have enough difference to really kind of bring, uh, at least you kind of make me think and, and question what I'm, what's, you kind of help me drill down on things that I need to kind of drill down on. So I appreciate the, the discussion for sure. And, and I, I, yeah, I'd be pleased to come back on and, and, uh, and do this again. Awesome. Well, this, I think this is going to be a shared show. So thanks for coming on my show and I'm happy I got the chance to come on your show. Perfect. Let's do it again soon, man. All right. See you next time.